All right, you guys. So today we're going to begin by talking about the basics of astronomy. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how we know where a star is located in the night sky. And to do that, we use what are called celestial coordinates. And the most common form of that is the equatorial system. And the equatorial system works a lot like latitude and longitude for the Earth. There's a horizontal component and a vertical component. So the horizontal component that is quite like longitude is called right ascension. And then the vertical component that's like latitude is called declination. So the way we, that it works is we split the world into 24 hours long-wise, or 24 sections. So this is for right ascension. And starting at the vernal equinox, the vernal equinox is zero hours. And as we go around in a circle horizontally around the Earth, we go from zero to 24 hours. And then to make it even more fine-tuned, because that's a large range, we can do there's 60 minutes in an hour, and then there's 60 seconds in each minute. So it allows us to break down each hour into smaller pieces and fine-tune. And then for declination, declination is the vertical component. And instead of breaking it into you know, 24 declination hours, what we do instead is we do degrees from the equator. And so we do positive degrees if it's in the northern hemisphere, negative degrees if it's in the southern hemisphere. And then each degree can be broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. There's 60 arc minutes in every one degree, and there's 60 arc seconds in every one arc minute. So that allows us to fine tune our vertical position. So for example, the coordinates for Betelgeuse to start in Orion are five hours, 55 minutes, 10 seconds, and then positive, so the Northern Hemisphere, seven degrees, 24 arc minutes, 26 seconds. And so that could pinpoint to an exact location on a star. Say here, this is where the star is located, those would be its coordinates, right? And so the next thing we want to talk about, now that we know where our stars are located, we need to get into the finer, tune, uh, finer tuned areas of the double star research, which we have two stars, so we want to describe the angle that they have with respect to one another. And so the way we measure this angle is we measure from north and we go through east all the way until we find our secondary component star. So our, our primary component acts as our um, origin for our axes, and then from north, we travel through east till we hit our secondary. And notice this coordinate system seems a little bit off. It's because east is on the wrong side. So a lot of the time in astronomy, this is how we present um, these cardinal directions, our northeast, south, and west. So don't be confused if you see this. Just know to be looking for the e towards the east direction. And we measure this angle in degrees as well. And the symbol for it that we use is called theta. Right, and so this theta is going to be a number that represents the position with the star and the, the secondary component with respect to the primary component. And the next thing we want to talk about is separation. So separation describes how far, how far apart the two stars appear to our naked eye. And so it's measured in something typically the size of arc seconds. It can be arc minutes or degrees, but usually these stars are very, very close together. So we use arc seconds. And the symbol we use for that is called rho. And the reason that separation and position angle are important is because we eventually use them to describe the star's location with respect to the primary. So in this example, the primary is located here on the x-axis. And this is images of the secondary taken at different times. And you can see how it looks like an orbit. It looks like an ellipse. And so from this, we can gather that it appears that the secondary component is actually orbiting that middle star. And over here on this example, the primary component is located here at this um, origin, and then the secondary component just seems to be getting further and further away with no curve to it, no, um, no orbit that appears to be happening. So based on separation and position angle alone, we're actually able to decide at least a preliminary idea of whether we think the stars are orbiting one another or not. It could be that we're stretched out, and we've taken some measurements, but that it's been a while, that it takes the star a long time to orbit around. But we can extrapolate at least that we know that they're either in an orbit right now or we don't know or they're definitely in an orbit, which is the important part of separation and position angle. And so al along with separation and position angle, we have other measures for determining how related double stars are. One of these is parallax. So we want to find out how close the stars are actually to one another in physical distance. So parallax is a method that uses angles to measure the actual distance that stars are away from Earth. And so by measuring the distance that one star away is from us and then measuring the distance that the other star is away from us, 
we can find out the distance between the two. And if stars aren't fairly close, there's no way that they can be orbiting one another. So this is the way that we can actually find this out. And the way parallax works is a little bit complicated, but it measures an angle between our two perceived locations of the star at different places. So a good example of this is if you stick out your thumb and you look at an object across the room and you close one eye and then open the other eye, the object seems to move from place to place. And that's what parallax is. We measure the angle that that object appears to move and from that we can find out the distance. And so closely related to parallax is a distance called a parsec. So it represents a distance that a parallax of one arc second is. So if we have a parallax of one arc second or the object appears to move one arc second of distance, we know that it's one parallax away from us. And one parallax is equal to 3.26 light years or it's equivalent to traveling to the moon 40 times and back. So it's a really big distance. So when we talk about these parallaxes here, they're gonna be given in usually milli arc seconds or really, really small values. And so we use these two quantities to tell how close stars are to one another. If they're far apart, then they're actually not gonna be able to orbit one another because they're too far away. So that's another good measure. And then one of our final measures that we use is called proper motion. So the universe is expanding in all directions and so stars are expanding in all directions. The interesting thing is if stars are orbiting one another, they should expand in the exact same direction and at the same speed. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to stay together. So proper motion is the term used to describe the velocity of stellar objects. And velocity is a special term. It's a vector and it describes the direction that something is going and how quickly it is moving. So it allows us to compare these stars and see if they're actually heading in the same direction at the same speed, which allows us to know whether they could ever possibly be related to one another. So for two stars to be related physically in any way, they have to share a proper motion. And so just to describe proper motion a little bit more, we have a couple figures here. So these two cars are going to show an example of two stars that have the same proper motion. So they move at the exact same speed and in the exact same direction. So we know that they could be related or they could be close to one another. Whereas if we have two stars and one star is moving faster than the other, they could be close to one another at one moment, but then one will outpace the other. So they can't possibly be orbiting one another. So for example, these two cars go and one totally leaves the other in the dust. And then for a third example, um, excuse me, the stars could be going in totally different directions, which would mean there's no way that they could ever be related. And so that's what these cars are doing to show. And so those three metrics, the position angle and separation of a star, the distance that they are apart, and their proper motions are going to be the three, um, three general things that we're going to study about a system to be able to define whether they could possibly be orbiting one another, whether they're definitely not orbiting one another, or whether they are, whether they're physically, physically related in any way. And then some other things to talk about, just basics wise, is we're gonna talk about the magnitude of stars. So when we talk about how bright a star is, we're talking about magnitude. And magnitude uses a special scale. It's called a logarithmic scale. But if you read these descriptions here, a difference in one magnitude is a difference of 10 in brightness. So if I have a magnitude nine star and a magnitude 12 star, there's a lot of difference between those. It's more than just you know nine through 12, it's more than just the three. It can actually be 30 or 100, right? Not 30, 100, excuse me. And so the other thing that's interesting with magnitude scales is that the lower the number, the brighter it is. So a magnitude eight star is 10 times brighter than a magnitude nine star and 100 times brighter than a magnitude 10 star. So the lower your number is, the brighter your stars are, which is an important consideration when we're trying to take pictures of stars. If your two stars that you're trying to study have very different brightnesses, it's going to be hard to get them to expose well on an image and actually be in the same image together. So it's something we actually take into consideration as we move further in our double star research. And then the last thing that I really want to talk about is distance in astronomy. Often we talk about vast distances between galaxies, between stars, between us and stars. And then we have these really tiny measurements that are between the small optical measurements that we see. And so understanding the metric system and understanding using the reference sheet to understand these distances and how they relate to one another is essential. So that's gonna be something you're gonna to wanna to practice, turning from one unit into another unit and just use the reference sheet, use this um, metric prefix table to be able to practice that. And that'll help you to be able to understand 
the vast and small distances we use in astronomy. And then as far as units go, we just wanted to talk a little bit more about right ascension and declination because they are a little bit different. So right ascension uses hours, minutes, and seconds. So it's not a base 10 system like the metric system. It's base 60. And so you just have to use conversions like you would time. And every one hour, there are 60 minutes. And every, and every one minute, there are 60 seconds. And so that's how we're going to do right ascension conversions. It's just a little bit different from the base 10. And declination, luckily, follows the same system as right ascension, like time. There's 60, in every one degree, we have 60 arc minutes. And every 60 arc minutes, we have, or in every one arc minute, we have 60 arc seconds. And so instead of being base 10, they're base 60. So it's good to practice a little bit and work with those as well. And then although these conversions with the units are similar, the way they describe them, their distances they describe are actually vastly different. So knowing that declination is degrees, arc minutes, arc seconds, and right ascension is hours, minutes, seconds, is actually pretty vital. Well, and that's the end of this video we have that goes over the um, PowerPoints here. If you have any questions, go ahead, read through it again, look through it again, look through the reference sheet, and then go work on the homework to go test your skills.